Okay, so I was interested in starting what I'm calling Healing Thursdays, where I want to teach the Word of God regarding healing. And you know, I was thinking how uh, I don't really have like a healing ministry or a pedigree of healing, but I do have the Word, and the Word has its own pedigree of healing. Now, there is value in respecting and honoring a person. I don't want to say looking to a person, because you look to God when it comes to receiving from Him. But there is value in respecting a person and looking to them. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, He said that you search the Scriptures thinking that in them you have eternal life, but you don't come to me the author of eternal life. He was saying, in a sense, you need to come to a person, the one who's anointed, the one who's speaking the word, the living word. So having a respect and a desire to come to a minister who's anointed to receive things is good. It's correct. It does not mean you are uh, like cheating on God to say, brother so-and-so, I'm going to go to brother so-and-so and they're going to pray for me. No, but... No matter what, you can go to Brother Bible and receive the Word, the living Word. We're not just taking this Word that's written on pages as our only uh, understanding. We're taking what's breathed from the Holy Spirit. It's breathed out through the minister, and it's breathed into our hearts from the Holy Spirit. So, that's what we trust. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a little pause, and I'm going to grab some magnification tools because the lighting above my head is not superb, and these make it easier when it's not superb lighting. All right, let us start out today with the message being life, because God is the author of life. I want to set some foundation here on what God says about healing. We'll start out with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. I think that's the farthest back we can go. Which is good. If you want to start with a foundation, start from the beginning. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. So what did he do? There was nothing, and he spoke to it. He said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. Then he continued through all the days of creation, you know, speaking to the waters and the creatures. And then in verse 20, it says, Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Does he say dead creatures? Barely surviving creatures. No, living creatures team with swarms of living creatures. God is a God of life. It says, let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves <clears throat> with, which, 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 bleh, bleh, with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. God saw that it was good. So when God created living creatures, he put life in them, he said, that is good. This should be elementary, but sometimes religion makes elementary uh, sound intelligent. <laughs> you know, the basics are too much for it. It's basic that God says life is good. He created life. It's for us to have. Then we go down to verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So God made man, right? He formed them. Then in chapter 2, and verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils 
the breath of life, and man became a living being. So God breathed life into man, and man became a living being, or a speaking spirit, or had a soul, however you want to translate that. But he breathed life into us. And he didn't blow us up like a balloon, as one minister put it. You know, he breathed, he spoke into him, breathed his spirit into him, we'll see later. Life into man. Now we know man uh, fell after that, right? In chapter 3, well in chapter, yeah, in chapter 3 it said that uh, the serpent deceived woman. In chapter 2, actually let's just, let's just go there. In chapter 2 it says, verse 15, Then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, from the, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat from it you will surely die. So God breathed life into the man, and then he said, Hey, don't do this or you're going to die. Man went and did that exact thing. So now there's no longer life. There is still life in the earth, because he said the earth's going to teem with life. But there's death in the earth now, because man disobeyed. That's no bueno. Let's run over to Deuteronomy, chapter 30. Deuteronomy, chapter 30, and verse 15. You know, this stand is kind of annoying. There we go. Verse 15. He says, see, this is God talking to the people of Israel. Because God always had a desire to bring life back to us. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. He set them before you. He says, I'm not dumping death on you. He said, I've set this before you. Here it is. There's one. Here's the other. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land which you are crossing over to the Jordan to enter to possess it. I call heaven and earth to, to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God and obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days. God wanted us to have life. So he told us about the blessing. He told us about the curse. And it's very clear that the blessing comes in loving him. God's not just needy. He's not saying, oh, you got to love me, you got to love me. You know, we have this, if, if you read anything about mythology, it sort of gives you this idea, like the gods in mythology, they're all selfish. Mm. Like they're vying for worship. Mm. Well, God wants your worship. He wants you. But God's motivated by love. He wants you to live. He wants you to have good. And you're going to have it by loving him. By coming to him. He didn't have to tell us about the blessing and the curse. If he said nothing, we would have been in trouble. So just by the fact that he says, don't do this, but do that, it's because he loves us. It's because he wants us to have what he said there, so that you may live, in order that you may live, in verse 19. So God is the God of life and desires us to have life. Let's turn to John 1. John chapter 1, ha, and we'll see, this is fast forwarding way, way, way forward, because man sinned, right, and we entered basically into death, he gave us the law so we could operate in the blessing, it was sort of a, uh, I don't want to say a stop gap, because the law was good, but man's flesh made us weak, had we had, we had perfect flesh, which isn't a thing. That's no, pretend. Jesus. Don't even believe that. It's not not a thing. There's no perfect flesh. But had we had perfect flesh and perfect actions, operating in the law would have given us good results. It would have given us the results that are eternal life. 
But we couldn't do that. Which is why, thank God, he sent Jesus. John 1, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Excuse me, I'm trying to raise this up so I can actually use it. There we go. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So Jesus, in Jesus, was life. Jesus constantly spoke of life, and not just the mild, surviving-only level of life. Not just life in the sweet by and by. Life someday. You know, he did talk about eternal. But eternal doesn't mean sometime. Eternal starts now. You know, we, we get this theological idea that eternity means after we're dead. And nothing says that. He says you will have eternal life after you're dead. In fact, if we really get to it, Jesus said, If you live and believe in me, you shall never taste death. That's pretty strong words. Let's go to John 4 now. We're going to beat this living horse. Not literally. It says, John 4. I don't want to say beat a dead horse. John 4. Uh, let's start with verse 1. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to, the, to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied of his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. This is a pretty natural situation, right? He's thirsty. She's drawing water. They're out there working. He says, give me a drink. And his disciples, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. They're hungry too. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So in the simple, natural situation, all that was coming out of Jesus' mouth is talking about life. Jesus, being the express image of the Father, speaks life. That's what is in his mind. That's what comes out of his mouth. Verse 11. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing with which to draw, for the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Living water again. You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank it of himself? So she's thinking pretty natural still. He's thinking living water, and she's, I don't know if it just went right past her head. All she thought was water. Maybe she didn't hear the word living. Jesus answered and said to her again, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water, springing up into eternal life. Eternal life coming from within. We have an example of that water. Or we have an example of water. Excuse me. Just stirred with living. I was trying to read my word there. So we have an example in the scripture of water that's just stirred with living, livingness. Is that a word? Livingness? But not being the well of living water in John chapter 5. In verse 1 it says, After these things there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is in Hebrew, called in Hebrew, Bethesda having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, 
waiting for the moving of the waters, or stirring of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down into certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the waters. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. So that's just a stirring. That's not a well of living water. But the one who came and touched that stirring lived just from an angel stirring. Jesus said, I will give you living water, and it will become in you a well springing up to eternal life. So you have an angel providing a stirring of waters that heals someone, and you have the creator of the universe giving you a well of waters. What do you suppose that provides? We have, have to have expectation of healing. We must. There's nothing else that we can have outside of that. Everything that the Lord has said leads to health and healthy bodies. Let's go. Let's jump back. I don't want to read all of this, but jump back to Ezekiel. Because we're going to see where this living water is talked about. Where did he get this idea from? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, right? Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel? Yes. Because Jesus, you know, he, he did know the Father, and he does know the Father, but he didn't make up all this stuff out of the blue. It wasn't just like, I'm just drumming this out of my own mind. I'm a great author, and think of these, think of these things. God had already spoken many of these things. So in Ezekiel 47... It says, where am I going to start there? Let's just start with verse 1. I don't want to read forever, but it's so good. It says, Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, from under the right side of the house, from south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate by way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side, just a little bit. <clears throat> when the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits. And he led me through the waters, water reaching the ankles. And again a thousand cubits, and he led me through the waters, water reaching the knees. And again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the loins. <clears throat> again he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not ford for the water had risen enough water to swim in the river that could not be forded so that little trickle coming from inside the house became so much that you couldn't pass through it it was over abundant he said to me son or son of man have you seen this then he brought me back to the bank of the river now when I returned, behold, on the bank of the river, there were very many trees on one side and on the other. Were they dead trees? I don't think so. They were living trees. Then he said to me, these waters go out to the eastern region, down to the Arabah. Then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh. It will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. These are rivers that come out of the house. Or I think somewhere else it says out of the temple. They come from the temple. In Revelation it says they come out of the throne of God. So in Revelation it says they come out of the throne of God. And there will be many fish, for these waters go there, and the others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Now, where is the temple of God? Can anybody here point to a temple of God? I can. Me. The scripture says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit of God lives within you? These rivers that Jesus spoke of, the well springing up into eternal life, and the river spoken of in Ezekiel 47, and then again in Revelation, God was very clever. Because he made us the temple so that that river could come out of the temple. Mm -hmm. And what happens when that river goes anywhere? It brings life. God is a God of life. Let's return back to John. 
John, 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 John. John, the book of life. Let's see if I can jump through these. John chapter 6, verse 32. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said to him, Lord, they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. He's the bread of life. Then in verse 55, he says, For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father, God is living, sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who eats me will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Not will live eventually forever. You eat this bread, you will live forever, starting now. Mm -hmm. The moment you eat it, you're alive, and you don't stop living. That's what living forever is. Let's go, ah, verse 63 then. Jump down. It says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. So let's eliminate the religious idea that life is just internal or eternal. If we say something like a place is teeming with life, boy, that, that you know, that valley is just, teeming with life do we mean that someday things will live there do we mean that they just have joy in their heart no we mean there's a whole bunch of creatures there things are living coral like you said coral reefs teeming with life it means there's living things they're vibrant if you say someone is full of life do you mean that they just sit in their house and they feel okay no, they're usually energetic, they're strong, they're healthy, they're full of life. Someone on their deathbed does not appear to be full of life. But, if you're filled with the living waters, I'm going to trust what God said about the matter first. I'm going to believe that first. I'm full of life. You can say that, even if you're feeling like dirt. Even if you're feeling like you're on your last leg. You can say, I'm full of life. Because he breathed life into you. He's giving you the well of living waters. I, was, I wrote a little note about interstellar searches for life. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you had some astronomers mm -hmm. and they found like two microbes oh, yeah. on the moon, mm -hmm. they would lose their marbles yeah. saying there's life. How much more is there the life of God in us? Mm. Life. God's life. The Greek word life, or the Greek word zoe, means the God kind of life, the God caliber of life. Do you suppose that God has a walker? No. Do you suppose that he takes a long time to get up in the morning? Because he's got achy bones. In fact, he doesn't sleep. But he's full of life. And that's the kind of life that the scripture says that we have in him. That's the kind of life he desired us to have from the get-go. This isn't a Christianese uh, philosophy. This is God's design. From day one, his desire is us to have the same life he has. Let's go over to John, chapter 7. <clears throat> and in verse 37, he says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Sounds good. He who believes in me, believes in me, believe in him. That's all you got to do. As the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's the same rivers from Ezekiel again. But this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now we're seeing more clarification of what this life is. It comes by the spirit. The rivers of living water come through the Spirit. 
John chapter 8 and verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He wasn't just using these, that wasn't the Jesus' uh, brand name, life. He didn't just throw it around just to make it sound cool, you know, like, I've got my life water, and it's got life written on the side, mm -hmm. just to try and advertise it. No, he's literal, the light of life. So here we have it talks about life in the water, life in the bread, life in eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Mm -hmm. Sounds kind of creepy, but it's still true. There's life in his words. There's life in the light. There's life in the breath. There's life everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere God goes and everything he talks about, he's talking about life. Now we remember back in Genesis 1, how, or Genesis 2 actually, how God breathed into man the breath of life, but then man disobeyed, which led to death, right? But then Jesus came and he keeps talking about, you will live, you know, you will have the rivers of life in you, etc., etc., etc. Well, then in John chapter 20 and verse 22, this was after he had risen again. We have redemption. These disciples believe in him. And it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So we heard about a breathing before. God breathed life into man. Now we hear about it again. God breathed, or Jesus breathed on them. What was he breathing? Well, he was breathing the Holy Spirit, which must have been the life of God. He breathed it back, that thing that we lost through rebellion, through eating of that fruit, when he told us, don't eat of it, or else you're going to die. We got it back, and he breathed it back into us. And we have the clue, it's the Holy Ghost. Have you received the Holy Spirit? That is a guarantee. That's what he says, he's the down payment. The guarantee that you have eternal life is the Holy Spirit. Well, if you receive him at all, you don't have to have some wild manifestations. You have the guarantee of life, eternal life. The same life that God used to breathe into man. The same life that he said team and swarm and abound and everywhere it goes, everything will live. That same life is inside of you. That same life is inside of me, and we can release it through our words and through our faith. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. I'll pray for you, and I'll pray for you, and by proxy, I will receive for myself as well. Hallelujah. Because I like receiving good things from God. Father, I thank you for life. You gave us life. And in the name of Jesus, we receive that life, and I release that life to go forth, the river of life, to go forth and bring health and healing everywhere it goes. Right now, be healed, be whole, be full of life in the name of Jesus. Amen.